what he's saying feels more controversial than I think it is in application. Like, I think polls have demonstrated that the American public would like for there to be some measure of gun control in place. It's just not going to happen. But it's not because the will of the people is opposed to it. The people who are opposed to the gun control are probably louder and, by the way, have more guns. But I don't think those people are even close to the majority. But it's so wild what our public discourse is that it really jumps out when somebody says something that is actually like in line with the majority opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. It is Foxworth Friday. Dominique Foxworth, what's going on? Oh, what's up, man? Yeah, man. We're going to try to talk a little bit about the NBA. It's tricky. We're recording on Thursday. There's a game tonight. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know how <laughs> I much need- that- I need the Celtics. I need. I mean, we don't know what happened. The people who are listening already know, but I need the Celtics to win, man. Because last time I was on here, I had my chest out. I was making my big basketball pro- proclamation that the series was over and the Celtics were gonna win, and they ain't won a game since I said that. Yeah, yeah, it, it felt overish. I, 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 I definitely got overish vibes um, off of it. We're gonna talk a bit about that. Talk about this uh, hilarity that's going on in golf. I don't know how much a lot of you guys got to see of Dream On. It was the 30 for 30 that aired on Wednesday night, three hours about the 1996 uh, women's Olympic basketball team, the United States. And yo, that A was fascinating. B, man, a lot of sadness, a lot, a lot of sad yeah. stories, right? Like if I have a criticism of the film, and I know that you saw this part, Dominique, they wanted to go medal, and we just dipped our toe in that happiness for like 15 seconds. It did. Venus Lacey had a terrible car accident. Yeah. I mean, I so I watched it because you texted me and you were saying this is good. So I turned it on when you told me and I caught like the last half of it. And the la- the part I saw was outstanding. But I was thinking that I was not excited about this 30 for 30 because in my memory of it, women's basketball in general, we dominate and i didn't know what the story was gonna be i was like all right we and if i remember and i saw last night yeah in the gold medal game it was not a contest you can't make no drama out of that which is why they went to the off the court stuff and boy was that hard man yeah well you know the thing was and they had just so the story i read i think richard dice wrote something in the athletic about it and he said so when the pandemic hit and espn was trying to figure out stuff to put on television because there weren't sports it led people to go into the archives and to see what kind of video footage they had. And they had all this footage of the 96 Olympic team, right? Now, the drama, and I hadn't thought about this either, was that in 92, they got a bronze medal. And don't nobody uh, have less respect for a bronze medal than USA basketball. When they <laughs> when, when, when they got a bronze medal in 88 with the college players, they went and got Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Charles Barkley and eight more of them, right? They're like, this will never happen again. And I was thinking the same thing you were because the earlier portions of it before you got to it were really just about how hard they were grinding to make sure that they won a gold medal. And you were thinking like me, like I'd have had a hard time pretending like we had to do all this to win, but they showed some stops along the way that indicated why it is that they would want to, that they would have to do that. One thing that was kind of ironic about it is they built this team. I felt like along the lines of some of the mistakes that the men's team has made over the years, where it's kind of like an all-star team and you don't Mm -hmm. always think about all the things you need. And so what they didn't have was a power center, right? Like Venus right. Lacey wound up filling that role, but that was their thing. They didn't have a power center, which seemed like something you could have easily corrected. And so there was this six foot eight woman for China. Man, she was a low dog. Like, 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 <laughs> like she, she, she had, yeah, she had, she had moves too. Like yeah. you ain't got no problems with it. But no, nah, they were going in there and Tara Vanderveer is the coach who seemed like the single most unlikable human being that I've <laughs> yeah. ever seen. I can't imagine. Like what, what I found interesting about the way that Vanderveer, and it was just all just on you, on you, on you, on you, on you all the time and saying mm-hmm. wild stuff about people in the media and just on mm-hmm. the, it doesn't matter if you like me, I'm just here to get the job done. And 
I have always said that the environment around women's sports is far healthier than the environment around men's sports, like especially the arena experience. Like the crowds are so much more encouraging. They're far more less mm. likely to boo, you know, all of those things. It is much healthier, but the power dynamics of coach and player still remain. And so, like, I don't know if you saw that wild Cynthia Cooper story a couple months ago about all the stuff that she had been doing with her players at various stops. I'm like, oh, wow, that is bananas that these. The power dynamics, they remain. It's the high school power dynamics or it's the college power dynamics. It's not the pro basketball power dynamics. No, no. No. I guarantee you Chuck Daly wasn't <laughs> acting like that with the dream team. Oh, no, so, no, no. Yeah, I, I just, I, I saw that and, and I was thinking coming into it, obviously I was not excited about the gold medal game about, with Australia because like it wasn't going to be intense. But the funny thing is they're different challenges. It's not that it's easier or harder, but there's a whole different set of challenges when you're coming in with a team full of superstars, but in a sport where we only care every now and then, and they aren't getting treated like superstars everywhere. And then you throw Tara Vanderveer on top of it. And then there's race and class implications, sexuality thrown into that, which is a whole nother dynamic that complicates things on top of like the Ruthie Bolton story. Like you're, I appreciate the text. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, so one Ruthie Bolton, what you think her favorite Mary J. Blige song is? I oh. bet she can't. I bet she can't decide. Like <laughs> everything. And when I was looking at her, oh. I was just like, "All oh. I really want is to be happy." Like her whole steez, the life story yeah. that she told, like all of it. Like she been to every Mary J. Blige show. She done seen Mary J. Blige in five different countries. And I didn't need to hear her say a word. I didn't need to hear nothing about her story. When I saw her sit down with her hair the way it was and the band across it, uh, it, uh, that's a Mary J fan from a mile away. (laughs) Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it it was all there. Now, I think the superstar element that you discussed, what I found very interesting about that, and I think for me, as I guess I'm 15 when this team comes together, you know, and they do, you know, they had a whole year-long tour. Again, check it out. It's really, really good. It's three hours, but I really think it's worth your time. Um, and so, you know, we got that part, right? Like everything that's going on with them trying to get back to the mountaintop and everything else. But to me, those players were superstars, right? Like the ones at least that I was aware of, because I'm not going to pretend like I knew that whole roster up and down, right? But like knew who Lisa Leslie was, knew who Doss Daly was, knew who Jennifer, Jennifer Azey was, knew who uh, Lobo. Rebecca Lobo, Ruthie Bolton. Like we can go up and down. Teresa Edwards, who, look, it is 10 o'clock on a 10 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday. And I feel like Teresa Edwards, who played on the 1984 Olympic team and the 2000 Olympic team, is somewhere crossing somebody over as we speak. As we speak. When I saw that, that that's mind-blowing. That is incredible longevity. But yeah, you're right. Those superstars were there. Lisa Leslie. No, no, but I'm saying saying this, though. We thought, like, I'm thinking of them as superstars because I know who they are, right? Mm Mm-hmm. The idea that they were superstars within this world, but weren't like superstars at all, was kind of mm-hmm. interesting for me to watch because I was so engrossed in sports at that time in my life. Like I, Lisa Leslie scored 100 points in a high school game. You know what I mean? Like I knew, I knew who she was. I felt like I knew who these people were, and it was just interesting to. I mean, they got paid fifty thousand dollars for the whole year. That part you did not see. They made. 50 G's for that whole year. And for those of you who don't understand what I mean, what they had to do for 50 G's, they was flying all around the world in coach. And when I say all around the world, my, my people, they played a game in Siberia. (laughs) That's what you say when you try to be funny, but it was real. It was real. And it wasn't like they played a game in Siberia in front of 70,000 people. They played a game in Siberia and wasn't looking like a high school gym. Somebody going to explain to me why we doing this. Nah, it's the difference between being like a superstar as far as fame is concerned and as far as accommodations and treatment is concerned. Like, I'm fine if don't nobody know me as long as I can fly first class and uh, play in real gyms where, yeah. where I feel like they were talking about how they were practicing outside with in Canada outside with gloves on 
Because Tara was like, you get a day off. By a day, she meant 24 hours. Yes. So you don't actually get a day off. We practice today at 3 o'clock. We practice tomorrow at 4 o'clock. The time in between was your day off. Maniac. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like that, that was all so wild to me. And I think that part of what I hadn't really considered, really, and you know, I think Dawn Staley had mentioned it. She was like, when they stopped playing college teams and started playing professional teams, she's like, we basically had two people on the roster who had played professional basketball at that point because it wasn't really no bread in it for them right so yeah. these women that i'm thinking of as being these great basketball players were like taking time off basically you know they, they like in the yeah. in between they was just kind of like oh wow so we're going to get the band together oh okay <laughs> and see and that's the drama in context yeah. that i wouldn't have had like why i was thinking like you like what's the drama we we run this right mm -hmm. nah there's like actually there's a lot more that went to it but i want to know what you think about this part of the film which is I don't, I don't know if you saw this it was the discussion about basically trying to make the women seem as straight as possible and yeah. that the nba's marketing strategy was market them like you market women and everything else basically like right. put them in put them in pretty dresses right try to try, try to make them look hot and there's this great scene in there where they try to get don staley into something and don staley is not hearing it dog okay don staley is not trying to get in your fly hot gear or whatever it is and the woman that works in the store is like oh we're going to get them hot and the idea was that if people saw these women in these pretty dresses and they looked pretty and nice that that would make you want to watch them play basketball and am i the only person that thinks that that is the dumbest logic in the world right with YouTube TV, watch live TV like cable. You can get started in minutes and watch the NBA Finals live on ABC. And without long-term contracts or hidden fees, YouTube TV lets you stay up to date with real-time stats and highlights of your favorite teams. YouTube TV, everything live TV should be. Try it free. New users only, terms apply, cancel anytime. You know, it's amazing the first time you discover something that really made an impact on your life. Like for me, one of those things was yoga. Just to free my mind and free my body. Nobody wants to be tight all the time. But when that happened, it changed my life forever. But what if the same thing could happen to you with your job? What if there's an awesome job out there that was made for you? Well, thanks to ZipRecruiter, that job is easier to find than you think. ZipRecruiter works for you to make finding a job easier. Like a personal recruiter, ZipRecruiter sends you jobs that are a great match for your skills and experience. They can also help you discover new job opportunities that are the right fit for you. ZipRecruiter pitches your profile to employers for jobs you'll love. And if they really like you, they can invite you to apply. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated job site by G2. Are you ready to find a new or better job? With ZipRecruiter, that job could be right around the corner. What job will ZipRecruiter help you discover? Find out at ZipRecruiter.com. Like we got a great deal of room that we got to make up with in treatment and equity and everything else. But that seems to be the big thing. In 1996, we was just like, yo, let's lie to ourselves about things, right? Like, like let's, just, let's just go about that. And the step is in women's sports, we are better able to not lie about those things because our minds logically can just be like, yeah, I'm not surprised that a gay woman plays basketball. You know, like, like it doesn't, it doesn't trip off right. a cognitive dissonance. Like the gay male figure skaters, you come out. It's like, got you, right. got you. Like yeah. you're gay. I feel, I'll tell you my secret. I'm black. Boom. Okay. <laughs> then we go from there. When you get over to the men's sports, now all of a sudden, that's when we get into all of our head trash. I was just thrown right. off by the idea, and I guess looking back, you see it, that we had as much head trash in 1996 about women that we did. Right. And it really was a clear statement to me of how far, at least in that wing of sports, we have gotten to just being like, nah, just let people ride how they are. Because like Carl Nassib came out as gay in the NFL, but we ain't had, we have not had the gay dude come out in the NFL that's like gay, right? Yeah. Like, no, like that was the thing with Michael Sam when he was coming out. Michael Sam got drafted, and him and his boyfriend were smashing cake in each other's faces. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that was going to be a paradigm shift as opposed right. to the, I'm gay, but I don't really talk about it, and I'm just over here, da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. They not at that point where the women are, where it's like, yo, I'm gay, you know it, and this is how I get down. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's... 
even within, um, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to pretend like I'm an expert, but like, I think what you're talking about is like the more effeminate type of, um, gay person or yeah. that's like, I don't, I don't know that we go mentally into the bedrooms of these athletes, but if you were to go there, like you expect the football player to be the one who fits in the more traditionally masculine right. um, role, which you're right. The paradigm shift would really be if Johnny Weir was the best running back in the NFL. Oh God, I want that so bad. That yeah. would be outstanding. Yeah. That would be outstanding. Yeah, that would the, be the with, paradigm or, shift. Or even with the number five pick, you take Omar Little, right? Who is like yeah. the... The, yeah. the the in like the the traditionally right, yeah. masculine, but also boldly and obviously and unapologetically uh, gay. You know what I mean? Yeah, you ain't trying to fight I, we're talking about two different things. I think. No, no, a, no, a no, no. We're not talking about two different, different things. Different shades. What I'm saying mm. is this: like the Johnny Weir thing would be one. I'm saying, or another yeah, interesting right. paradigm would <laughs> yeah. be. But right. Let me. I, I want to switch gears just a little bit because we got something else I want to talk about uh, while we were here, which is the Live Golf Tour. Have you been keeping up on this? I have. Can I can I go back to this one more thing before we get to the live golf tour? And Gabe, you can cut this out if this isn't. There was something that jumped out to me that Lisa Leslie said at the end of it that I wanted to get your take on. I don't know if you caught this at the end. She was talking about being black and representing the country, and she was making the argument for, um, or not making an argument. She was talking about the pressure she felt to be to represent her race, and that was heartbreaking to me because like i i don't know I, i'd love to talk to her today and see if she still feels the same way but the idea that you are a black person and you believe that you can you can behave so well that they're gonna change the way they think about you and like yeah. to carry around that pressure and and it, it's a faulty it's an illusion to carry around that illusion that uh the jackie robinson illusion that's like we got to pick the right one because if we pick the right one and he acts the right way and says the right things i will be a credit to my race and that shit was heartbreaking watching lisa lie. leslie say that i would have cut that out the movie yeah i would have to i'd have cut that i heard that and i was like rrr, rrr, rrr. yeah like this i think i mean I, I, if I, you're not I, if you I think the director, Kristen Laff, has heard that in a way that you and I, maybe she heard the heartbreak part, but I heard that yeah. and I was like. Yeah, oh, I think no. that's why I wanted to talk to you about it is because like you either cut that out the movie or you make that 45 minutes of the movie or yes. 30 minutes of the movie. And she just made it a throwaway as if, um, it, yeah, I, you're probably right. I think a lot of society took that part a different way or took it how it was meant. And I took it through the lens of, I hate that shit. Oh, no, I'm with you too. Cause I'm like, hey, go win another bronze medal and see how America treats you. Um, win a gold medal. They, no, no, <laughs> they but I'm saying, go, no I'm saying go get the bronze yeah. though. They can't, right. we can't handle a bronze in basketball. A bronze. Okay. All right, we can go live now. I'm sorry yeah. about that. I just yeah. wanted to get that out. Have you been keeping up with the live thing though? Yeah. So I I, it's incredibly interesting to me just from a, a union representation part. And also like the obvious, like, um, moral <laughs> issues that stand there. But anyway, go ahead. I just think the moral part has been interesting. Cause a lot of these guys are just smart enough to take the money and shut up. Mm -hmm. Right. You take the money and shut up. You're going to wind up being okay, but you get, Greg Norman and Phil Mickelson and I think it was a uh, South African dude, Charles Schwartzel. I think it was him just basically on the, Hey man, all money dirty. Like that, that is basically do the that. point that they're making from top to bottom is all money dirty. And this money is too much for me to pass up on. This is my question for you, Dominique. Do you want to be in debt to the Saudis, to the house Hell, of Saud? Cause I, I don't, don't I don't want them to know who I am. No, I like, barely want to talk about you, it. Yeah, like if if I got a, a, a invitation to do something, I'd be upset that they invited me because like I don't want to be on their radar. Like they are on some some other stuff. But yeah, all money is dirty may be true, but that's the argument you want to make. And I think that golf is the worst place for for this to happen because it's it's full of a lot of like rich white heterosexual men who believe that from experience that they can talk their way out of anything 
And that's what I think is the the mistake right here. Because if I were to get into some something like this, I'm black enough to know. Lay low and <laughs> and feel like no, nah, I just got I just gotta tell them what I was thinking. I just tell them what I was thinking and they gonna get it. Nah, they ain't always gonna get it. Like my blackness would uh, would teach me right off the bat, and I'm sure a lot of other people their their ex- life experience would let them know off the bat. Oh, this is how we gonna handle this. We gonna shut the hell up, and then we gonna play dumb or like Phil learned this, the second time around. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make myself the victim. Ah. I'm suffering from all this debt is on me and I don't have no other choice. (laughs) Like you got to give somebody something to grab onto trying to stick your chest out and be like, Oh no, let me explain to you. That ain't going to how it's going to work. He thought that cop it to how bad people think they are and the bad things that they do. Right. He thought that cop into that would make it okay. And instead, no, it made it worse. Look, man, Colin Kaepernick explained very clearly why he wasn't standing for the national anthem. He became a pariah. Marshawn Lynch with all them dreadlocks and drinking Hennessy on television and everything else. Don't be standing for the anthem. Didn't say a word about it. Do commercials for Subway, right? <laughs> like, like every, yep. if you lay low on that, you would have wound up being okay. But like, so now we got the U.S. Open. And it's interesting because the PGA Tour does not do the U.S. Open. So the PGA Tour can keep these cats out of these other events, but the U.S. Open, the USGA does that. And so these dudes can show up. And so it's almost like Jets and Sharks in a sense where they got like yeah. two clicks that's out here. But I ain't gonna lie, man. Like, when, I'm not gonna lie. That dude, the South African cat that was basically like, hey, man, all these checks cash the same. Everybody got dirty money. I mean, he is a white man from South Africa, right? Like, yeah. I don't know what his yeah. views are on apartheid, but I'm pretty sure the majority down there was rocking with it. Otherwise, how could it continue to exist, right? I mean, it doesn't anymore, but you know what I mean, right? Like, I'm not surprised to see him be like, hey, man, atrocities in the name of money. Ain't like, we ain't never done that before, baby. Like, yeah. I could see how you get yourself to that place, and it is a lot of money. All I'm saying is, if you got $15 million and now you got $60 million, I don't know how much different your life is. I just yeah. don't. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that's, the, uh, that's the equation that I think about a lot or I've, I've used to make a lot of decisions. Like, I, I told you this before. I, I went to business school after I stopped playing football with the same mindset that I had in football. It's like, I'm going to go dominate. I'm going to go win. I'm going to go to best business school I can go to and find out how I can make $100 million. And then oddly, we took those soft classes about feelings and stuff, and, and that worked on me. <laughs> and then I came out like, I'm going to make decisions that can like optimize my life financially, but I'm going to make, like, today, I'm, I'm going on a fishing trip, a long bike ride and a fishing trip with my son. If I, was, if I followed that other stuff, I could not do that. You know, like, and those are the decisions that I had to make. And I was, I could make those decisions because I was fortunate enough the first time around in my first career. So I'm with you. I think um, Rory McIlroy made a similar comment. It's like, my house is already big and I don't know what to do with some of the rooms I got in there now. And yeah, like chasing more money is just, you're just trying to, you're trying to blow the team out. You don't have to blow the team out. (laughs) You already won. You know, like you, if you got a million dollars and you live in like, a uh, Western wealthy country, and you a white heterosexual man? Like goodness gracious, what more do you do you need? I, and I mean, the difference between fifteen and sixty, it's it's a tangible difference, I think, because like fifteen million is not private jet everywhere you go, money. Sixty yeah. million is, but it does not increase your happiness. Okay, I was about to say, you're right. That is a tangible difference. And that was the thing I saw when I brought this up in some conversations. The private jet was the thing that came up. And I feel you, the private jet, probably pretty cool. But man, first class ain't that bad. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, like I, I would have a hard time, even if I had all that money, justify the difference in the price of first class versus the price of the private jet, especially since them dudes ain't really famous. It ain't like you, Michael Jordan, getting mobbed right. at the airport and you couldn't imagine going through TSA. Right. Like we're not, we're not talking about that. You're not 16. You know what I'm saying? And and trust me, trust me. If you got enough money, you can, (laughs) you can get your way around all of that stuff too. But the, it's the price too. So like if I got to work 
a lot harder for five years to go from 15 to 60, then that's an okay, okay price. If the price that I'm paying is I have to take a private jet because I don't want to get attacked in the airport, like that's a different price. The price that they're paying is their reputation, which to me, that ain't worth $35 million or what's, what's the math? $45 million. Well, I also want to know, like, and I saw John Rahm talking about this um, on Wednesday, and it was a part that I hadn't thought about. The competitor aspect of this, right? Because it's not a full-on best of the best field they have over there. And the level that I hadn't thought about is they're doing three-round events that don't have a cut. Like, this is not golf in a tournament sense as these guys are used to or as they are accustomed to. And how fulfilling is it actually going to be for the competitor in them? Like, I get it. The money is the money. And if you want the money, that's fine. But it will be interesting to see if some of those dudes keep doing that. And that it's kind of like, yeah, it don't feel the same. But the problem is, I don't really know how you go tell Saudi Arabia, I'm out. Yeah, that's that's tough. You go ahead and breach that contract if you if you want to. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do. I mean, the, my best, I feel like the other side of this is hard for me because it it's like viewed as PGA versus the Saudi government. And if you have to pick sides, then it's obvious the side you pick. But it doesn't have to be that. I think obviously I would not encourage them to go do this. I, I think that if the public backlash falls on them, that's fine. But I still am opposed to the PGA Tour uh, trying to be the moral arbiter in this because that's not what they're doing. And that letter they sent out was disrespectful. They thought that the players were going to buy that foolishness where they try to call all these other guys greedy and they talk about loyalty. And it, it just, you guys are using your your mon monopoly power to control this market and they will be just as opposed to these players going to play in some other tournament or some other uh yeah tournament that was put on by a government that they that they respected they'd be just as opposed as they are to this one so they're using this as a good opportunity but i just don't like the idea that they're like all right now you're banned because you've played elsewhere when actually, or you're banned because you're aligned with the Saudi Arabian government, not because you're banned because you're affecting our business model, which is truly what they care about. Yeah. Cause I mean, the thing is Saudis just got more money to blow on this than yeah. the PGA because the Saudis aren't really in this for profit, right? Like the profit yeah, for them ways. is in image and reputation. Uh -huh. It's this concept going around called sports washing. I did some stuff for Freakonomics about this. You can check out their podcast. Now, I contend that quote unquote sports washing is a terrible waste of money. Um, they just had the Olympics in Beijing a couple months ago. Did it change the way you looked at China? I don't think it did. Did the 2008 Olympics change the way you looked at China? I don't think it did. Like maybe it made it better for like foreign investment. So the people who came for the Olympics saw the places differently than they had before and they would then be comfortable. But the truth is you put money in on China because it's a billion of them. Like if that's the, if that's mm. the reason why you're doing that, that's why you, that's why you playing this. And so for Saudi Arabia, I look at the idea of them putting all this money in this. It ain't making them look no better. It's making them look really, really rich. Like uh, some, yeah. uh, the Saudis bought some uh, soccer team over there in the UK. Newcastle, and, right? Yeah, yeah I, I, shoot, they all the same to me, dog. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, the, 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 the soccer teams, just to yeah. be clear. They all the same to me. But, <laughs> I didn't even catch that. Yeah, yeah. I just had, I just had to make uh, sure we had no confusion. You did? Yeah. Um, but no, nah, man. Um, ain't nobody looking at them differently because yeah. of this. I just don't like, did anybody look at the Soviet Union differently when they were dominating as sports? I just think that's a poor, ineffective strategy. And maybe it has some, like ancillary effects that I'm not able to see. Like I'm not in the rooms with rich enough people to really see what they get out mm -hmm. of it. But I don't see it, right? And so yeah. these players are going over there and doing this. And you're right. They're torching their reputations. Did you see that J Jack Nicholas's company is suing him? Like the Nicholas company or whatever it's called is suing not. him? Because he went and sat with the Saudis and heard them out. And so they use that to say that Jack Nicholas is doing damage to the Jack Nicholas brand. He absolutely is. I mean, I, I would push back on your idea that it's not worth the money. And that I think in some, I mean, you're probably right. But I do think that 
I guess the argument is where would you where how would you spend this money else in another way to accomplish this goal? If you ain't gonna start acting right, you need to give people things to look at and talk about that make you seem better than you are. If everything that's in the American press is about um, killing gay people, uh, extrajudicial killings of journalists, like if that's all that all that we get, um, harboring 9/11 conspirators like if that's all the stuff that we get then they need to combat that news by behaving better or behaving in a way that we appreciate or giving us something else shiny to look at so i think more than anything is it gives them a distraction i guess another storyline that's that's uh that's not in opposition to the one that's out there but it's just different you think of saudi arabia you think of newcastle united and you think of live golf and you Think of all these other things and not the horrible things that they've done. Yeah, but I mean, I guess I just don't know who the people are that are actually going to do that. Yeah. You know, and maybe yeah. they're out there. I don't feel like I know those people. Right. And I think that that for me is where it's kind of, like I feel like. I feel like you could pull something like that off within a local market. Right. Like, say you own the nuclear power. Like you're Mr. Burns. Right. Yeah, you own you the local nuclear power plant. You buy the baseball team, you win the World Series, and now rather than being the guy who owns the power plant, you are the mm -hmm. guy that owns the World Series winning baseball team. Maybe that works. I don't know if you could pull this off on a great yeah. big old national <laughs> level, especially not at this point. You know, yeah. like that, that I don't, that's the part where I'm like, I don't exactly know if we can pull it off like that. But um, it is. It's the ultimate all money ain't good money. Except these cats are like, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Every dime of it is good. I want to know who the person is that's like going to fall on some hard times. Like you talk about Mickelson and the re re reputed gambling debt and the likes. The guy that pops up out of nowhere like, hey, man, y'all still looking for people? Yeah, 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 yeah. How soon can y'all get that check over to me? Can you get it to me by next Friday? Because if you can, I can play golf next Friday. You just let uh, me know. But it got to be by next Friday. The level. <laughs> I can't play golf with my legs, bro, baby. <laughs> the level of desperation. And your point about them having, like, unlimited money is, uh, I mean, I'm sure you saw the reports of how much they offered, like, Tiger Woods and the bigger name guys. And uh, I guess, yeah, you already live in the life. You're already in the top 0.01% of the world like uh, maybe not 0 0.01 0 0.02 you want to get it to 0 0.01 <laughs> I, I don't know what's different i don't get it it ain't worth it um for me but tiger woods certainly ain't gonna be the one to do that he done, he he felt what it felt like to be on the wrong end of right. american ire he uh, and for much lesser transgressions than what Saudis accru uh, are accused he, he of. Must, he would have had to do the full-on post-divorce heel turn. Although I will say this with men in America, if they had come out and offered him that million dollars and he took it in 2010, 2011, they're like, Tiger, what are you doing? And he's like, she took half! <laughs> he might have been able to like curry some favor with some people, but Tiger Woods is like, yo, that billion dollars is... Uh, he's like, do you know how much forgiveness I have received? Yeah. No, nah, dog. Y'all go do that on your own. You have a better chance of getting Derek Jeter to sign up for your little league than that. <laughs> like I broke, I broke up all my legs just so y'all could be nice right. to me again. Right. Imagine him calling Michael Jordan and being like, "Yo, you want to be down with the Saudi Arabian Basketball Association? Are you out of your mm. mind?" Mm -mm. It ain't worth it. I mean, not that politics and sports is a new thing. Like it's been going around since sports was around. But I, I think, guys. It's all about confidence when it's time for sex, am I right? Sometimes stress, anxiety, or a bad day can affect your performance and ruin the fun for both of you. BlueChew.com to the rescue. BlueChew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Because Blue Chew is an online prescription service, there are no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And it ships right to your door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. 
Blue Chew's licensed medical providers work with you to find the right ingredient and strength for your prescription. And here's a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code BOMANI at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code BOMANI, to receive your first month free. On this topic, there's also like the the more domestic stuff, like the gun stuff that um, Joe Burrow got in. Did you see the Joe Burrow? Mm-mm. Oh, yeah. So Joe Burrow, like, I mean, it was a pretty tepid, uh, benign thing. But Joe Burrow has been outspoken on issues of race and class before. But he came out and just said that he hopes that politicians can get it right, uh, essentially, as far as gun control is concerned. He didn't come out and support a specific bill or or say that he wanted assault ref- rifle ban, like literally, but he just kind of came out and said, I'm not doing it verbatim. I'll, I'll um, send you a link if you need it. But the point was, generally, he's out there. And I, I think that he's come to position himself as someone as a bit of a social leader and willing to like expend his white champion capital on which like that makes me like him he's willing to expend the cow him and i remember page page buckets a yukon after her mm-hmm. freshman outstanding freshman season she's at the espies and she out there talking that talk and willing to expend that white capital on things that don't impact you dude joe burrow won the heisman trophy got on the microphone and spoke on child hunger and poverty crazy yeah like he's a they only seem like I won't say they only made one of these, but he's the first one of these that I've seen. Yeah, and I, I don't. Especially. I don't have a quarterback, black or white, because the black dudes especially got to lay low. They hard enough to get a job, right? Um, <laughs> outside, obviously, of Colin Kaepernick, but even yeah. Kaepernick was not the level of star that this dude is. And even as I look to be fair, like Mahomes picked up on the Black Lives Matter, and you know a lot of those cats got on that as the George Floyd stuff was going on. But Burrow, it does seem a bit more focused. Like, this is his bag, right? Like, he wasn't in a moment on these things. This is what he does, and he figured out what y'all gonna do. Nothing. That's yeah. right. And then it's gone from there. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the ultimate F you money and F you privilege and F you status. The people who have all that stuff, they never use it. <laughs> or they don't use it for the things that, like, I would, I would imagine that, I would use it for, but Joe Burrow seems to be about that life. Uh, yeah. If but you're not think- going to outlaw everything, you've got to at least make it harder to get those crazy guns that everybody's using. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's pretty much the crux of what he said. Yeah, but I think the other thing where it becomes interesting on the gun control discussion is what he's saying feels more controversial than I think it is in application. Like, I think polls have demonstrated that the American public would like for there to be some measure of gun control in place. It's just not going to happen. But it's not because the will of the people is opposed to it. The people who are opposed to the gun control are probably louder and, by the way, have more guns. But Mm -hmm. I don't think those people are even close to the majority. But it's so wild what our public discourse is that it really jumps out when somebody says something that is actually like in line with the majority opinion, which is what I, what I think that Joe Burrow is doing, but we're also just so used to quarterbacks going out of their way and basically spending their whole lives saying as little as possible. I mean, it doesn't serve them. Joe Burrow. I mean, maybe the world is changing and maybe this is the modern uh, blueprint, but I guess honestly, like someone has to set the blueprint, like the, if if Joe Burrow is like carries on this Kaepernick um, and to some degree LeBron legacy of being like outspoken and involved, then I think the expectations will change. But there's no reason for him to do it. It doesn't benefit him in any way. I mean, I guess it benefits him because he lives in this society and his idea of improving it. But I, I heard somebody uh, on a podcast a couple of days ago. I forgot the name of the podcast. I don't know. But anyway, the point was... Uh, there are lots of people who have a relationship with guns that is different than than like our east coast major city experience where like i don't hear about guns unless somebody get killed but there are people who like their life and their culture and i'm sure you from being in houston and in atlanta like you know these people and you talk to these people nobody in my life have i ever known anybody like been really close with anybody that be out here like, I mean, I guess I had some football teammates who was hunting, 
but most people that I'm who go hunting, but most people who I'm really close with, like only time I hear about guns or we talk about guns is because somebody got shot or, or there's an article about a bunch of people getting shot. So like the idea that we should have these guns to me is like, I don't even think we need guns, but I also didn't grow up in a culture where, where guns were fun and guns were recreation. Like I'd be pissed if somebody was like, you know what? We don't even need basketballs. Yeah, no, well, that's what I did for fun. Well, so if there is a gun, then we need guns, right? That's the unfortunate yeah. trip over the situation. Now, my thing on that is this. I understand having a gun. It's the second gun that confuses me. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, like if the second gun is like your hunting rifle and you got your pistol. Got you. Okay, that makes sense, right? But it's the second pistol where I'm mm. just like, so what exactly does this pistol do that your, your original pocket-sized killing machine uh, will not accomplish? I don't remember if I was talking to you about this, but I said this before. Hey, man, the pistol is one of the more enduring inventions of all time. Like, if you go get a gun from 100 years ago and shoot somebody with it, that person is still going to die. They're going to die like they would have died before. There was no need for them to be souping guns up and trying to find a whole new level of gun, at least not for, as a consumer good. There was no need for that. So when I look at people like, yeah, they got a different relationship with guns. That's what they do. But I say it again. I don't know why you need all these guns, especially yeah. the Brett, Brett, yeah. Brett, the country grammar. I don't know yeah. why you need the country grammar. They're like, oh, well, I just like the country grammar. Cool. We're going to have to sacrifice some of this want stop people yeah. from lighting up schools it's just a thought yeah. it's just a thought yeah. now I, i'm with you and i agree with you wholeheartedly but i think that the argument on the other side is like i got a bunch of tennis shoes i only need one pair yes but those are tennis, tennis shoes yeah, i was gonna no, make that same comparison right those don't kill people kill people right, right. like that's but, that's 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 and the, i guess their argument would be, and I'm doing my best, which mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't have, I shouldn't do in the first place, but I think that their argument would be, like, I don't use them to kill people. Like, it's a hobby. I like it. But, I collect and, these see, things. They're collectibles. The, but that's the problem. I, 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 I want to mm -hmm. do this. It's the same reason people want to go get this damn shot, right? It's yeah. I, 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 I want this. I want that. Why I can't have my fun with guns just because people out here shooting kids. Hey, like, don't you realize how ridiculous that sounds? Like, fundamentally, yeah. when, when people get to it, is that, yeah, but I want to be able to shoot cans in my backyard or go to the range or whatever it is. And that's just, to me, that's just not that big a sacrifice. Um, but yeah. hey, that's, that's where we are. And I do, I do give, I absolutely do give Burrow credit while also recognizing how crazy it is that something like that is something for which we do give credit. And not because he isn't doing something nowhere. Well, it is because he's doing something that shouldn't be noteworthy, but it happens right. to be noteworthy. There we go. Did I make sense of that? Charles, you only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. <laughs>